tonight, please be careful as you walk on this grassy area here and pathway. There are some deep holes here, Commissioner Ryan. We don't want you to fall in. Um, there is one restroom in the building. Our food has been provided by a neighboring restaurant, Post Shines. Some ground rules for all of us tonight. Please be respectful of our city representatives. Due to time constraints, we needed to limit our Q&A session to one minute questions only, not comments or remarks. So if you are asking questions, we're gonna ask you to keep it brief. We welcome constructive disagreements, but realize that this meeting will not solve all our community challenges. So we remain patient with unresolved conversations and issues. Thanks to those who did submit questions in advance. Due to time limit limitations, we needed to condense, condense your questions and group them into related topics. So some of your questions may not be exactly as you wrote them. We will share all submitted questions to Commissioner Ryan's office, however. Tonight's program will include Commissioner Dan Ryan and representatives from uh, Emergency Management Net Team and uh, Emergency Communications. We will conclude our evening at 7.30 and invite you to stay and mingle. I encourage all of you to be optimistic about our dear city as we move forward with new government structure abound with positive changes. Thanks for your particip participation. And now I would like to pass the microphone to Kimberly Dixon, the Neighborhood Program Supervisor. Thank you. And I didn't say, I'm Mary Jaron Kelly from North Portland Neighborhood Services. Got my name. There you go. I can't hear you giving it up for Mary right now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It is my honor to be here, and you did not come here for me, but it is still my honor to be here to introduce our favorite North Portland person, uh, somebody who and I have come successful. to <laughs> be extremely, um, how can I put it? I think somebody who can meet me on my passion level, I deeply, deeply, deeply like them. And that is what I think of when I think of Commissioner Ryan. When I think of his dedication to the work of serving, when I think of his dedication to all citizens here, when I think of his dedication to all communities, that's what I see. Somebody who's in passion, somebody who cares, and somebody who is here to share and answer as much of your questions as he can. Commissioner Ryan. That was fine. I'm usually not introduced like that, so. Thank you very much. Good evening, neighbors. I live in Arbor Lodge. My name is Commissioner Dan Ryan, and I'm so thrilled to be here tonight. I love that it's outside. It was really a wonderful thing to notice. And before I get started, I want the employees of the city of Portland who are here, because I forgot to do this at the last ones, to acknowledge yourself. First, let's start with the Office of Civic Life. Everyone from the Office of Civic Life, raise your hand. See them, they're all back in here. All right. And then I know there's others from the city here, from parks and, and et cetera. Please raise your hand. Okay, you're all standing up back there. So notice who they are. Please go up to them after the meeting if you have additional questions. And, and so I'm just really glad that you're all here. Thank you. And thank you for your service to the city. It's uh, been a, a wild time to be in public service. I've been in office since September of 2020. And I got off the sidelines because friends encouraged me to. And I uh, was never accepted of school board, which is very mission driven. Thank goodness. It's all about the kids. And I did it never thinking about running for office at this level. And I'll just tell you. That, what was that? What did it say? Connection successful. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll hang with that as long as I can. Um, my hope tonight is to connect successfully to all of you and tell you exactly what I know from the bottom of my heart about uh, what it's like to be in public service today as we face many, many um, challenges that are, um, what's the word of the last few years, unprecedented for our city. And I really appreciate the positivity of the tone 
said by the previous speakers that we really need to come together and do this um, as Portlanders for the love of our city. You want me to really eat the mic? Okay, wow. I can't get much closer than this. Um, I have a few notes that I wanna make sure that I hit. First, I'm very proud of what's gone on in the Office of Civic Life. Um, I got the assignment in uh, June or June. I got it in January. For good reasons, perhaps, I don't wanna unpack the history. I'll just say that I could tell that the last five years have been rocky. Is that okay? All right. There were, there were groups pitted against each other and in my opinion, never should have been pitted against one another. And I think that many neighborhood associations and most of the nonprofits have figured out how to come together to collaborate. But sometimes I don't know if the office set up that collaboration as well as we could have. And so my ask of when TJ McHugh took over, um, left my office for a while to drill down into the Office of Civic Life is like, let's bring this together. We need both. We need the neighborhood associations, we need neighborhood groups, and we need nonprofits, both small and large, to be a part of the fabric of those neighborhoods, because guess what they are? And so are the small businesses, and so are the renters, and so are the homeowners, and so are the schools, and so are the parks. Like that's a neighborhood, and so is arts. So all of it is a part of the fabric, and our city's only gonna come back one neighborhood at a time. During COVID, that's what kept us together was the love and support from our neighbors when we were isolated and we weren't isolated within our neighborhoods. That's where we had our connection. So that's what's gonna bring us back. So I really hope that you've noticed there has been a change in tone. There has been a change of how we're showing up and I'm really experiencing that. And I also think that that's been a part of the scaffolding that we're building to welcome the district form of government, civic life and its role is gonna be more important than ever because in fact, civic life has to get back to its root of its mission, which is to be a steward, an objective, key word, an objective convener of all the different opinions in the neighborhood and then something coming at them from the city. We don't come at you with a political point of view. We come at you in service to make sure that you're listened to and you're understood. And whether it's from BDS, whether it's from parks, whatever bureau, whatever division of the city, that you can have an objective dialogue about that. And our job is to convene that engagement. And that's what I believe in when it comes to how we set this up, because that's what we'll need in every district in the city. And so we're building that scaffolding as we speak. I've been working with the mayor's office um, on this, and we've been, in, we've been working with the, the transition commission to know that that's important, that this bureau will transition to building that scaffolding and being of service to all of you. So I think you'll just see that um, building um, over the next uh, year, because it has to, because it's happening uh, soon. Um, I also wanna say that Portland Solutions is um, a model within that, and it's to make sure that some of the livability issues that have been front and center for a lot of us, whether it's the complaints about the trash um, in, in the city, whether it's um, issues around how community safety is showing up in a trauma-informed proper way, all of that will be a part of Portland Solutions so that you don't, the goal is to not have to navigate and go downtown for everything, but to actually come to your district uh, reps and, 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 and have a place where that dialogue can take place. We're lucky that in North Portland, we have beautiful firehouse and it's settings like this that I think are going to be way more robust as we move forward when you have three people representing North and Northeast Portland. Uh, parks, I want to touch on a few different things. I've had to focus on, uh, on downtown because the fact is that downtown is the heart of our city. How many people have been downtown this summer? Oh, thank you. That's better than other gatherings. Thank you, North Portland. It's the heart of our city and it pumps out that uh, economic vitality to the rest of the region. And if you don't have a downtown that's robust, if you don't have the currency, if you don't have the activation of downtown, it's really difficult to see the revenues flowing out to other parts of the city. All great cities have great downtowns and those includes parks and plazas. And our parks and plazas have been, I would say neglected over time and all of them need some love. But we're starting with bringing back O'Brien Square, which is now Darcel Plaza. And we're also um, activating Director's Park, which was not um, showing much life just into the last few months. And it's really helping. And you're seeing more foot traffic downtown. 
and that is important. I always think of it like if you think of a turnstile, downtown is where adults spend the money, and that money helps us all out. And if you drain that, um, it's really difficult to come back. It's not an either or, it's an and. And of course, and we've had to look at providing services and parks out in the different parts of the city, which definitely includes North Portland. My biggest honor was making a tough decision on where to put the North Portland Aquatic Center. And I really uh, focused on equity and I focused on children. I really think the crisis of our children not learning how to swim is a life and death issue. And it's really important that we place it in a, in a location that had the most access to North Portland. Because I went to Roosevelt High School, I know that there's a big part of North Portland that exists after Portsmouth. I call that true North. You know what I'm saying in this crowd. A lot of people don't. And so I was really attached to having it be in the center of true North so that the elementary schools in the Roosevelt cluster would have access to that. Why can't we do what David Douglas school system does, which is all their school children in the elementary years have a PE course at their local uh, pool at the high school. So they have a high literacy of swimming proficiency. We need that in Portland, Oregon. And why not that? Why not start that in North Portland? So that's the vision on the North Portland Aquatic Center in Northgate. And I'm really proud of that. Is there anything else I want to talk about? Levies. I think a lot of people know that, thank you for the support of the levy in 2020. It shows how much people love our parks, but I will say that that went to operations and operations are different than capital. So you're hearing a lot about the capital, the challenges that we have, the the, the debt that we have, the, the, the fact that we have um, prized possessions in our parks portfolio that need some love and, and care. And we have a deferred maintenance list that's long. But what is that maintenance list? What is the infrastructure that we need in the next 100 years? The big issue as are we having global boiling is not to replace every bit of our infrastructure with the same way it was made, but how do we adapt it to where we are today and the concerns we have going forward? So I always say that we have to look at that list differently than we have in the past. It's not, it's not just replacing everything on that list the same exact way you did, because we're moving towards electrification. Let, let's figure that out. But until we have that, we still got to figure out how to get a, around. So there's a lot of challenges as we make um, decisions on how we move forward, but they have to be future, and we have to think towards the future. We need to do that with parks as well. And so that's why I explored down in Salem with the legislator, thank God, uh, commit, um, not commissioner, Representative Nelson was a champion of exploring uh, an art, a district, a parks district. A lot of major cities have that. It's a way to manage your long term. And whether we do that or we get into the, the capital bonds, just like the school district does with levies and bonds, we have to figure something out because depending on the general fund year in and year out is not going to give Portland the parks that they desire and they deserve. Arts. I'm very passionate about the arts, and I really want to make sure that you hear this because it's in the news right now. Um, we have had a regional arts and culture council for 28 years. We're not getting rid of that. We are moving away from a sole source contract with one provider called RAC, and we are opening it up to other providers. And we need to look at how we can take out those requests for proposals, whether it's for a working artist, whether it's for small, large organizations, and who are going to be our new partners that will carry out that work with strict rules on overhead, which is not a bad word, but it has limits. And how the goal is to have the proportion of money going out to our working artists and to our arts organizations um, proportionally in increasing. Right now, I am not seeing that. And it's time to explore the com competition of having new partners come in to explore those contracts. And, and RAC will, of course, be a part of that building and will be included in, in that opportunity. And finally, on the arts, I just want to say that I can't think of a better opportunity for us to elevate the arts than right now. At a time where our city needs economic, um, we just need to, our economy needs a, a, a kickstart. And nothing brings a city back better than arts. It, it gets people um, downtown, it gets people to neighborhoods. They go, obviously, on, um, to restaurants, um, to other establishments. They're out, they're joyful, they're spending money. We need arts, and it's grim right now. There's some arts organizations that are not doing programming this year. 
So we have to focus on arts as a major economic driver to get our city to move forward. So that's where I'm at with arts. And as somebody that studied arts in uh, college, it's really uh, important for me to know that you know that artists are scrappy, they're entrepreneurs, they're ambitious, and you want them in your city. They right, you revitalize the ecosystem. And so I will be a really, um, I will be, I will be focused as long as I'm in service to the city that arts is not dessert. It needs to be eaten first. It's a big part of your diet. And when I was on the school board, I pushed it as well. And it's really important that we continue to make sure that arts is a big part of our, of our city and our ecosystem. And we cannot allow it to continue the way it is. And so I'm looking forward to the, to the, to the creativity that will merge out of this and the new partners that will come forward. The Office of Equity and Human Rights, it's at the heart and soul of everything we do. It's a lens that, that must always be a part of every decision. So when we uh, put out to request for proposals when it comes to the, the new contracts with arts, they will have to identify who they're serving and what the impact is on that service. I believe what you measure does matter and you can't just leave equity up to a philosophy. It has to be measurable and has to have impact and it's definitely always front and center with everything that we do. And I will end with the fact that I'm really thrilled that something happened this last this last election in May, and that was that we passed the children's levy. And I was told by a lot of people it would be tough, and it was. Raising money for that was not easy. I heard, um, let's just say every phone call took three times longer than they have in the past, because you heard about um, people's frustrations with taxes. I think there's a lot of people, a lot of my most liberal friends um, will say that they're tired of seeing their taxes go up and their services go down. So that's just an equation that we're dealing with. Yet they know, especially after coming out of COVID, where I think that nothing was more damaging to our entire um, city and our entire state and entire nation than what how our children suffered. Those children that didn't have access to education um, Education is a personal, it's personal. You don't, it doesn't work over Zoom. I read to kids in kindergarten classes during during COVID. It was so sad. I mean, you'd have to like try to get them out of bed, literally. Like, come on, Penny, uh, uh, pull your cover up. We're, we're reading to you right now. And I just thought, how were those teachers day in and day out trying to engage with those students? Well, the fact is that it didn't work very well. And we saw, we saw a lot of the gains that we made in improving achievement for especially communities of color and such um, widen once again, just during two years, like gains that we made over a decade really were washed away in a year and a half. So it was so important that we pass the children's levy so we can continue to make investments in the evenings, in the weekends, in the summers, because that's when the achievement gap always widens. All of you who are blessed as grandparents, I'm just assuming there's some grandparents in the room. How many grandparents in the room? All right, so you're there, and I know that you try to do all you can to engage with your grandchildren, and then the parents that have that time to focus. But some, some parents, some single parents, don't have that access to resources in the summer and the weekends, and that's when oftentimes um, achievement uh, falls back. And so it was really important that we uh, improve, we we pass that, and we continue to work with our schools to have um, extended learning in the summers and evenings and weekends. So I'm really proud. Thank you, Portland, for passing the children's levy. Everyone said it would be rough to get to 60%, but you love your kids so much. You, you, we passed it with 70% of the vote. I'm very proud of that. Thank you so much. Yeah, clap for our kids. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because I, I, I can feel Ginger. Um, she's like, Dan, we have a lot of questions to get to. So let's go ahead and pause there. And again, I think the people from the city that are there, one reason I had you raise my hands is because I might call on you to help with some details um, with, with answering some of these questions. I have to stay at a, a certain elevation to, to take it all in. And that's important when you're in a role like this. Hi, Ginger, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me in the back? There are, okay, great. There's a couple, like four seats up here in front, five seats. Um, Oh, you can't hear me. Now can you hear me? No, I'm right on top of the mic. It's even touching my body. That's what I try to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, you got to really kiss it. It might be better without it. Does that help? 
No, no, you don't think so? Go for it. Just... Go for it. Okay. There are four seats, five seats up here in the front if you're standing in the back and you want to sit down. But Dan, you mentioned kids and achievement. I'm going to go with one of the questions that goes to that right away, okay? Questions came in from the community and uh, some of you may have submitted these. Also, some of you have questions. So we're going to go back and forth. I'm going to answer one of the questions that came in from the community. And then after Dan answers that one, we'll go to one from you, okay? And then we'll go back and forth, back and forth. Looks like you can hear me better, Bridget. I've raised my, my voice a little. Okay, Dan, first question. Considering the recent Guardian article that calculated the third graders, students aged eight or nine, who have grown up within two miles of Portland International Raceway, could experience more than a 6% point decline in their standardized test scores, how can you, as Commissioner of Parks, allow the continued use of leaded fuel at PIR? Some strong uh, clapping uh, throughout the room, but especially over here. We had a meeting on Friday. Well, first of all, when Commissioner Rubio uh, handed me most of her portfolio while I was handing her most of mine, this came up. And I was informed that there was a decision made not that long ago to stop selling the leaded fuel, step one. And then it all was around how can we get really crisp and clear evaluation from the authority at the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ. So we had a meeting on Friday with Representative Nelson, who was following up on this advocacy from former Representative Kotek, now our governor from our neighborhood. And the meeting, it became really clear the next step is to have um, the DEQ actually take this seriously and not um, and not um, have it be told that there's no capacity right now to, to perform this. So we're lobbying to have DEQ do objective testing. I don't know why you're shaking your head. I still, it really helps when you make a decision because there are also people that would clap really loud, maybe not in this room, about the fact that they love those. How many events are there a year? Too many from this group. Yeah, 40% of those just led, and there's a lot of people that also, there's a big PIR friends group that is also sending emails. I'm just saying that it's, that I'll get there, yeah. And so the fact is we're going to do that test, and we're going to look at what it's like on a, on a Saturday when there's racing. We also want to look at what it's like on a, win, on a Wednesday at 9 a.m. or at 6 p.m., and also, I mean, there is leaded fuel coming from um, Columbia Boulevard. There's leaded fuel coming, obviously, from the planes that fly nearby to um, PDX. So we need to have a comprehensive um, study so that we can really um, zero in on that. And I, I, and then we'll have more information. And so, uh, as, as Representative Nelson agreed that we need to have DEQ weigh in on this as the authority for uh, 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 on this issue. And that's what we're pushing on next. And we look forward to that meeting to actually have them come and start doing these tests. TJ, did I did I get that right? Okay. All right. Thanks. So more 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 on this. But this is the farthest it's gotten in terms of um, it, getting it raised up to the state level. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I've been advised that if you're really having trouble hearing, that the sound is much better inside the building. So uh, if you really want to get a better hear, a listen, you can go inside. Okay, now it's time for a question from the audience. Uh, let me see. I'm going to try to pick on somebody I don't know. Uh, you in the blue. You got to come up here and, and use this microphone. Maybe you'll be better at it than me. Hi, commissioners. I'm Susan Bladholm, and I'm the founder of Frog Ferry. Um, six and a half years ago, the city had an electric ferry service in the plan. It's in the central city plan. It's in Metro's comprehensive economic development strategy, multiple plans. 
It was in the parks budget under Commissioner Saltzman. He kicked it over then to the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, which was under Commissioner, or excuse me, under Mayor Wheeler. He then thought it should go to Prosper. And for going on seven years, we watched it kick around the different bureaus, eight of which relate to us. Our ferry consultants out of Seattle say the number one most important commissioner is that which oversees docks, which is parks. I know everyone thinks this is a PBOT thing. We really could use you being a champion behind this. And commissioner, I've tried now for six months to meet with you and asking to come in and brief you. I'm begging you. Please don't say no to this as Commissioner Maps is supposed to is trying to bring us to city council over hearsay. Let's please deal with facts and data. We have delivered five comprehensive plans to you, $30 million worth of value that people here in this audience have contributed to. And our planet is burning up. Please use this best practice and let us go after federal funding. We're not asking for local dollars. I'm sorry I'm so emotional, you guys. We just work so hard on this. Please, please let us come and sit down with you. I'm really sorry. So please tell me how we can schedule time to meet with you and have a conversation. I'm sorry I'm so emotional. No, it's okay. It's Susan. I mean, I know you and I have had conversations about this numerous times, and I'm sorry we haven't met in the last six months. I hope that people on my staff I know have been briefed with you. When it stalled last time, you know this, it's because it's difficult to take on, to build a system. It's a transportation system. And when PBOT and TriMet aren't lined up, it was very difficult for all of us to take, to, to move this forward. And so it does matter when you're building a system, right, to have all the different transportation systems aligned with bringing this forward. That's what we did with the streetcar, right? And so it is important for all of us to uh, to to be aligned as we as we move this forward. This would not be something you'd want to move forward with a split vote or. And so I I will um, take I, I, we will meet with you. We have met with you. We'll meet with you again. I'm sorry I haven't met with you with you personally on this. And um, I do think it's important that the PBOT uh, person is all in. I do think it's important for TriMet to be all in. I think it'd be very difficult for this to move forward if things were splintered. I'm not making anything up right now, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. I And I recall, so you just know, last time this came to the council, there was a skating um, email that was read by Commissioner Hardesty from PBOT from TriMet that made it really difficult for a lot of us to get behind it. So we can't have that be the tone going into launching this because it's going to be a big investment, an important investment. We have to use our waterway as we look at, yes, the, the climate's boiling and we have to have alternative ways of getting around town. And we are a river city. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Susan? Susan, you have an important topic, but we have a lot of people here with a lot of questions. Okay. This room is very, very supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cathedral Park, right? Can I have you guys? I have to remind you we have one minute per questioner because we have lots and lots of questions. And so try your best. I know it's hard, I know it's hard. Here's another question that came in online. The city of Portland currently does not enforce no camping buffer zones around county shelters built the same way they do for city shelter buildings. Will you expand this no camping buffer ordinance to include county shelters built within the city of Portland? I don't have the authority to tell the county what to do. I do have the influence to remind the county as partners, and I did that when I was uh, the dotted line to the county overseas, the joint office, to take good neighbor agreements seriously. 
that the buffer zone is not just for the neighbors that are housed around the facility, but it's also for the people that are receiving services within the facility. When people are going in to receive services, you have to be optimistic that they're choosing to take a step towards building more resilience, a step towards services that will turn their lives around. The last thing they need is to come outside of that shelter and be triggered by people that they've used with, for example. And so I always like to remind that the buffers are for both sides of the equation. If we're going to actually see results from this humanitarian crisis that is very complex, that has been complex for years, but is more complex today because of the poisonous drugs, which are literally killing people almost daily, that are frightening people who aren't writing TriMet the same numbers as they used to. Why? Because of the fentanyl smoke. Secondhand smoke went from cigarettes to fentanyl in Portland over the last year. And so we must take all of this seriously, and we need to have the buffer zones around the shelters, in my opinion, again, so that it makes it more of a sacred space so services and healing can take place. They're going from isolation to connection. They're building community, and they need that safety surrounding them as well when they're inside the shelters. So I hope that you'll make that clear to also your representative in this part of town, uh, Representative Jayapal and others on the county. So when they reopen the Arbor Lodge, shelter the county when they reopen that it operates differently and better than it did when it was open prior to the, re the, the remodel okay thank you You're welcome do we have dan or doug pardon me yeah. i got one i give me the car uh, hey george yeah it's coming up there i don't know if they'll reach there yeah i got it um i drove down to the end of lombard on my way here and where the street was recently rebuilt a couple of years ago i counted 27 dead trees um would you please uh, would you please come to a compromise with peabot and reinstate fronts with trees because we're losing the canopy in portland yes yes we will we will definitely look into that the the investment from the levy did allow us to hire more people in urban forestry. However, the silo that you're talking about is what the issue here. And so as a city, when, when Peabot does the construction, there's the maintenance. And we all know the first five years of a tree's life, I'm an avid gardener is really important. And so I, I, I'm sorry that that happened. I, I, it's, it's, it's a, a Why I'm a Week article actually exposed that to me recently as well. And so um, I will have conversations with Commissioner Maps about, at minimum, how we can have a better handoff so that Parks, who has now building up an infrastructure to do maintenance of trees, can improve because we need that tree canopy. And thank you to all of you who water your trees, have trees in front of your house. I know our house is one of the main uh, shade uh, rest stops, and I really saw that last week during the heat wave. So I want to thank everyone that's providing the uh, tree canopy in your neighborhood. Thank you. Hey, George. This is George. George lives next to the um, to the peninsula crossing Cypress Village. We met with George about three weeks ago. I do have some good news. You know about that, but you you asked the question. Good to see. You. Yes. You know, we are going through some challenging times there. And uh, thank you. George, hold the mic. You're all close your mouth. Of course. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. I find the good news that they will put asphalt on the front of the village. So the gravel noise will the be gravel covered. will be covered. There will be no no much. Uh, give me my card. Thank you. Health issue. Would you be willing to meet with us and discuss the breach in the village, the breach in the toilets? The toilet doors are constantly open. They pray, they put a cones 
between the doors so they don't shut. And the toilets are 14 feet from our windows. Yes, so are the wash machine and everything. Then also the lightning is interfering at night. Yeah, it's very bright. If some of them could be just turned off for the night, it goes right in the windows. Then we have a rat problem now. The rodents are showing up around our house and uh, we are very uncomfortable with that. Also, if the toilet doors could be switched, the hinges the other side, so they open the other side yeah. because they are facing to, to us. And then the garbage container is right on the our fence, 12 yards from our house. Good news is that the garbage is not picked up at three o'clock in the morning. Right. Yes, that is they the come case. through to the day, daytime and that's a big relief. And that would be like, so this, these are my concerns. I would like you, if you would be able to address this with me sometimes. George, thank you. This is a new list and it, it, it's going to keep evolving. And um, as you know, we had a habitat of a lot of people living inside the peninsula crossing and the habitat's been moved. That's probably what's going on with rats too. And so it's an issue all over Portland. Um, I deal with it as well. I have a monthly right. bill, but my point is we will get on that. And these are new lists. Can I keep this? Of course. Okay, yeah. yeah. And this weekend, we're going to pave in front of the park, the parking lot's gravel, and it keeps people that live, like, basically uh, put away from the uh, village uh, up at night when that, that happens. The garbage used to be picked up at three, long story, now it's picked up at a more civilized hour, and the screening and the plants are arriving, too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But also, uh, is there more on the left? Would there, would there be also a spot? Would it be also put asphalt inside the village? There is a gravel inside the village. Would you cover this too? No, you're talking about paving inside the village. Yeah. Oh, George, why? Okay, um, I, I can't talk to that right. I can't speak to that right now. I can only uh, tell you that we have the work order in this okay. weekend for the parking lot. It's is that on your list too here? No, TJ, we have to add that to this list. Okay. No. All right. Thank you for listening. Absolutely. To and I want to thank you for um, keeping us honest and staying on us all the time. Yeah. I enjoyed the morning uh, visit with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And and I, I have you noticed that at least I've noticed the the people who run the Cypress Village are you know are communicating with us very thoroughly. And I, I know that that's helping. And so this is the kind of dialogue we keep we must keep doing. I just have to add that some of you might have participated in this. It was three Saturdays ago, but how many people even have used the precision, the, the Peninsula Crossing Trail in the last decade or prior to this? Okay, that's good. A lot of people told me they haven't used it in a long time. And now people are saying, oh, thank you. I can finally run on the trail again, bike on the trail again. And that was one of the reasons why we went into the heart of that trail is to make sure that the amenity could come back to you when we built the Cypress Village. So I just want to say I'm really uh, pleased with the park rangers and the coordination with the um, impact reduction team to keep that clean. And I hope that all of you remember now, because a lot of people said they got out of the habit of using it. Please use the uh, Peninsula Crossing Trail again. It, it's, it's, it's very lovely and it's an amazing asset for North Portland. And I'm sorry for over a decade that wasn't available to most of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Dan, be careful. You're kind of back up against. Oh, I'm I'm in a hole, and then there's that behind me. Okay. Yeah. And we need Dan. We need you to stand back here so that people on Zoom can see you. Okay. I know you like to get close to your your constituents, but um, we need you back here. All right. Okay. Here's another question, real quick. I'm not very close to constituents when they can't see me, though. No. Yeah. That's it. why we need you to be here. These guys are you're 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 close to these people. You're in the same backyard. I am. I like okay. it. Yeah. So here's another question. How will your office support the ongoing call for the city to reimagine George Park 
Will you support the Kids Outside Growing Vision for Reimagining George Park? Uh, someone's here from Parks, Ken. Yeah, let's make. I want to make sure that that gets on the agenda coming up because we do want to look at those smaller parks and neighborhoods that have been ignored for some time. I went to Roosevelt High School. I know where that park is. I won't tell you what I did in that park in high school, but I will say that um, that park needs some love and attention. And uh, it's a big part of our community safety strategy is to have uh, parks that are um, activated. And, um, and and of course, the youth always have the best perspective on uh, what you could do. But all Portlanders love their parks. It's where we play. And um, I was with uh, some people from Iceland um, that were here just for like 15 minutes, but they made it really clear that sport and play is such a big part of their mental health strategy. And I think that everyone knows that in this in this this lovely space. And parks um, is one of those few places where we can really offer that as a city. And so we have to keep all of our assets um, up. And we also need more friends of parks. So we also need more neighborhood engagement um, and ownership of those parks. And I, I love the messiness of parks. And what I mean by that is um, where people play, there's also some fascinating conflicts. So I know more about dog leashes and not on dog. Anyway, I know a lot about dogs now that I didn't know. I know a lot more about pickleball than I ever could have imagined possible. And and, and that's a big issue right now is um, like, that's a good example of assets. So we have these um, wonderful assets called tennis courts and some of them are dilapidated. So do we <laughs> resurface them again as tennis courts? Do some of them become pickleball courts? I don't want to start the controversy right now, but I will ask a question just out of curiosity. How many people here play pickleball? Okay. I'm going to do this at every meeting. That was fascinating. Um, how many people here play tennis? Ah, oh, tennis be pickleball in the North Portland. Okay, noted. Um, anyway, it's a fascinating thing that's going on in our city right now is this pickleball tennis thing. So, um, but when we please have those debates um, because it's 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 passionate and it's about being playful. And next question. Yeah, I still need you to move back a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, I need to see my and gut. Then, um, those people out there on Zoom, they want to see you. Yes. Yeah, not just your that. elbow. Not just your elbow. Okay. All right. It's time for a question from the community. Um, George, I Laura. won't forget this, but I'm going to put it here so I have a marker. I'm using it as my marker. Oh, now I'll use this. Now they put it in the name. Okay. Will you oh, come over here? Yeah. Because otherwise I'll get in trouble by Ginger. <laughs> I just wanted people to know that we on the North Portland Peninsula live in a sacrificial landscape, and part of that is the part of that is the PIR. Um, your office doesn't accept my email, so it's great to be able to talk to you. The mayor's office doesn't either. I complain a lot. Every summer, on average, I have to leave my apartment at least I don't know ten times um, per race season just to get away. I can't live with it. It's so loud. I'm sad we don't get to hear it tonight because it's really the NASCAR races are just are just horrid. And then to know you you know the city was outed by the Guardian and the New York Times about noise pollution, which takes years off your life. And you know IQ points off of children's um, scores. They're being bombarded. I mean, swimming is nice. It's important, but they need to be able to breathe. And lead is a killer. I can't believe that the city is, <laughs> is going along with that, you know? And you're talking about tests and meetings and things. People have been complaining about this for 30 some years. I was born and raised in Portland. I grew up in Arbor Lodge. I remember the racetrack, but it was nothing like this iteration which is loud and furious. But then, you know, we were exposed to a lot of things then, Dan, you and I growing up in this part of the city. So I wanna say that um, the city needs to deal with the PIR. There are a lot of complicated issues. Zenith, the CEI hub, my God, we have some really scary things to deal with on this peninsula, but you, you, City P uh, Parks and Rec, you oversee the PIR. Can't you take it out of commission, move it? I don't know what, but a bunch of lead every summer is not okay. Simply not um, conscionable, conscionable. So that's what I'm, that's my ask for you. 
that's the show notes. Thank you. Um, I think I addressed that earlier, and um, I appreciate the passionate statement, yeah. and it, it did impact me. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, what actions are you willing to take or will you be taking to promote Kenton to have more retail and food services available for our North Portland community? I haven't. Uh, I've had meetings across the city with some neighborhood associations, I mean, business associations in those small neighborhoods. And although I frequent some of the businesses in Kenton, I haven't met with the group. And so what I'm promising today is to get that on my calendar because you really need to first start with the listening session. Because what I found is each each neighborhood is different. All right. So um, TJ, that's the guy, the Terrence, that's going to uh, get us on our calendar will hold me accountable. So that's where I have to start. And um, the through lines with each neighborhood um, business association has been around um, community safety issues and um, making sure that people feel safe uh, to go out and that the vandalism goes down. And so some they've impacted me the most. As, who has impacted them most since I've been in office for almost three years has been small businesses. You didn't have the luxury of going on Zoom you're meeting your customers directly and i think we've done a disservice um to our small businesses and we've made a lot of bigger we've made a lot of uh, decisions based on larger organizations and i hope all of you who have the luxury of being working remote um remember that and get out of your uh get off of your social media and out of your zoom calls and frequent uh, the bricks and mortar small businesses in kenton in st john's in University Park. Okay, it's time again for a question from the community. And I only want people to raise their hands and have a different topic, not one we've already covered. Um, let's see. I have somebody pointing at uh, Lauren. Come on up. Please remember, it's just a minute to say a question. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Close your mouth, Laura. Oh, okay. Um, Dan Ryan, council member. Uh, a number of us thought that you were going to be um, a hero for health and safety in our community and for the climate. But we were really disappointed and stunned when you uh, gave Zenith the land use compatibility statement that they need to continue their their um, their uh, their operations. And we feel that um, we're not safe. You know, you were talking about safety. I don't feel safe uh, with, with an, uh, a predicted earthquake and with potential train derailments. And what we want to ask you, uh, well, an, an, another thing is that Zenith promised, you, you did that on the basis of Zenith's promise that they would move to renewable diesel. We haven't seen studies of how safe renewable diesel is. I mean, renewable diesel can explode. So we haven't seen that. And also Zenith is known, and you know that Zenith has been untrustworthy. They said they were going to be pulling back uh, crude oil uh, transport through the city, but they haven't, they've increased it. So we're asking you that you made that decision and we were stunned by it. And there was tons of community comment. You know, you, you were also talking about listening to people. We were not listened to. There are a lot of people, neighborhood associations, thousands of people signed petitions and they were ignored in all of this. So I'm asking you now, We a, a number of us have a number of questions for you and other city council members, but one very simple one is, given um, what you know, will you promote within the city council an education and alert program for the people of the city of Portland and the Portland area and alert us and educate us about the incredible risks that we're facing from earthquake from train derailments and from continual cumulative pollution that we face. Will you educate people about that instead of keeping it behind closed doors? Will you be out and tell people the risks that we're facing? Simple yes or no question. Yes, the entire city council has to meet on this bigger picture issue on how we convert to electrification. Right. 
Well, first, I just want to say that because it, anyway, yes, we need, um, and we have people here from uh, PBAM, we have people here from uh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez's office that looks at how we respond to um, a crisis in, in terms of any emergency. And so we, we need better communication about that, absolutely. I did, first, I did deny the Lux, and you know that, and I think uh, uh, the, this, uh, what you, many people are happy about that. I brought in the Native American community uh, to make that case, which was a new one. I went against the bureaucrats and the legal team at the city to make that decision. When Commissioner Rubio and I met with Zenith, we saw concessions that we'd never heard before, and I think that's got them to the table. Uh, and I'm just giving you like what happened. The promise was to go to renewable fuels within five years. I've just met them when I got this job. I don't have a deep relationship with Zenith. I've been in one meeting with them. So my question to all of us is, how do we move towards electrification quickly? How do, how many people, I'm just curious, how many people got here tonight by using, or got, or went somewhere this weekend using your car that uses um, fossil fuels? Just curious. Good, that's great. All right, so the fact is we all have to behave more like you. This is behavior change work, and it has to be done in a way that actually builds that infrastructure which is gonna have some of its own environmental challenges. Um, and we need to move on that, I get it, as quickly as possible. And so that's a comprehensive uh, decision that has to take place, not just at the city, but the county and the state. It's a big picture issue. And yes, Oregon and Portland should lead the way. And I think that you will continue to see that the lobby um, for us to move in the right direction is, is, is in, intact. Um, but right now we have to figure out how to provide that infrastructure. And when I talk about the infrastructure that we currently have, isn't going to be the infrastructure that we need going forward. And it's going to be really expensive to do that conversion. So if we eliminate, um, when we eliminate something like Zenith, we have to replace it with infrastructure that's electrification. You can't just shut that down and then not have the ability to move around. I hear that many people here would say that. There's also many people that would say, how are my goods and services going to get to my business? How, you know, so it's it's a complicated conversation. But the fact is we have to have the Yeah, it was a citywide decision. But the people at the Bureau of Development Services that were working on this, they, 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 they did their best to like look at the codes that are currently in place in the city. So we have to update the codes, obviously. Yes, I am not the head of BDS right now, which doesn't take me off the hook. Commissioner Rubio is ahead of that, but it's a collective decision by the entire city council, and we all have to work on this. Got it. And the only agreement that we have right now is their um, agreement to move towards uh, renewable fuels. It was, it's in a letter that has been published. Yeah. 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 I hear the passion, but we've got more questions here. Here's another one from the community. What is Parks and Rec going to do and how are you going to support them to maintain family, school, and local services at the Charles Jordan Center when it operates as an emergency shelter? So the question is, when we need to use Charles Jordan as an emergency shelter and takes up a lot of space and we cancel the classes, is that what it is? It says, what is Parks and Rec going to do to maintain family, school, and local services at Charles Jordan? Well, the Parks does the really the best job it can to do both things, to both provide the services and to provide shelter during, uh, for example, global uh, warming events, during all, all of our um, extreme weather situations. And Parks is a real good partner 
with the rest of the city and the county to provide those spaces. And the cost of that is that we have to cancel some of the classes and services for families that use Charles Jordan. So it is difficult. And so if you are in, in, in and if you are helping make these decisions, first and foremost, you got to keep people safe in extreme weather situations. So we do start there. And it is a consequence. Um, and we talk to our partners about that and how important it is to keep it um, cleaned up after. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Michael Brown, a lifelong resident of North Portland. Um, my two oldest, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, yeah. You got it really uh, close. How about this, better? Yeah. Okay. My two oldest grandchildren were on the swim team when we became a lifeguard and has credit for three saves. My two youngest grandchildren don't know how to swim. What will it take for us to repair, reopen North Portland's only indoor year-round swimming pool um the same people that were attempting to serve with this aquatic center if and when it's built we're also taking away the swimming pool from those folks um it's just so important another friend of mine world war ii veteran saved three lives during world war ii and the skills he learned in that pool and so i'm an advocate for a lot of other things the skate park and things like that but in, as as this as the season ends for the swimming season, this those doors will close in North Portland. Those doors will remain closed for the Columbia Park swimming pool, while Southwest and every other area of Portland, they have their swimming pool. So what we're asking for, and I've got a lot of people with me on this, that that pool needs to be repaired and reopened. It's the only pool that we have in North Portland, and it's about saving lives. If it saves one life, it's worth it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. This one's hard. Um, I don't think anyone at Parks enjoyed the fact that after the levy passed and there was um, literature that said we needed operations money because there were many of our facilities and many of our operations that we were closing down because we didn't have enough money for staffing. And Columbia Park with Columbia Pool was on that list. And then when uh, the engineers went in and did some studies, they discovered a couple very expensive um, issues. And so I inherited this um, and it was, it, it's what's the price tag parks? Where are you? Yeah, Ken? No, the cost of the damage with the concrete and the leaks. So we were told by the engineer and by parks that it was a 10 to $15 million cost at the end of the life of the asset that needed to be either renovated majorly to or we needed to site it somewhere else and so commissioner rubio made the decision to uh, agree with parks um, leadership to close columbia park and focus on building the next aquatic park and then helping with transportation services to matt dishman which of course is in a in the inner part of north portland And so the decision would be, I'm, I'm well aware of that. Everyone knows it's the only one in, in true north, in North Portland. And, and so we are moving forward as quickly as possible with the North Portland Aquatic Center. And we think that taking 10 million out of that to preserve Columbia Park for another three years would delay I realize what you're saying. And so um, this decision was made um, prior to me and I'm trying to just land this so we can, and I've been focusing on the future, which is a North Portland Aquatic Center.
And so this is a tough situation and it's tough that we have so many of our assets are at the end of their life and it's expensive. And this is one that's really, really important. And so it's, um, is there anything that you want to add, Ken? Yes, yeah, please. please. This is Ken from the Parks Bureau. And Ken has been a real champion in terms of me working with him to understand North Portland when it came to the decision for the North Portland Aquatic Center. So any additional information that you can give me, I've had this assignment since January, sure. and this has definitely been one of the hardest ones for me to um, personally uh, figure out how to move forward on. No, no. no, thank you for the time. So I'm running the community engagement on this project, and nothing would make this easier for me than uh, for that pool, for Columbia Indoor Pool to be open during this process. Um, it's, it's a very difficult uh, scenario that we're in. Um, the, 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 the issue, there was a good question in the back during your comments. What's the budget for the North Portland Aquatic Center? It's about $50 million. The cost to repair Columbia Indoor Pool is much smaller, but those funds, it, they're a different color of money. They can't, the 50 million cannot be used at all for maintenance. They have to be used for increasing um, capacity. Um, those are system development charges and money that's been uh, granted through the support of Travis Nelson, uh, Representative uh, Nelson of District 42 here in North Portland. Um, so I don't think I can add a whole lot other than it is a very difficult situation. Um, well, the, well, what I can tell you is the escalation in inflation in the last few years has been in staggering staggering um just if, uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, yeah can we move on or do you want to um... i really understand and i personally do miss columbia pool i swim there all the time but we got to move on because we have time for one more question from the community and i need to know that it's a question that hasn't already been asked Okay, come on up. We'll try to fit in this one too. Hi, Ashley. Ashley, can you make it quick so that we can get one more? Yep. Um, so I know we're all about irony here in Portland, but I have to just point out the irony of standing here and listening to Dan talk about the engagement with the community when I've heard almost every single person that has gotten up has said they haven't gotten a single response from your office, me being one of them. So Kelly, TJ, maybe you guys need to check and make sure your emails are working. I don't know what's going on, or maybe you need more staff, but no one is hearing back from your team. And so you need to know that that's how we're experiencing you and your position, okay? Thank you. So with that said, I represent a large group of neighbors from the University Park Portsmouth neighborhood. And we live directly around the Safe Rest Village, which we're thrilled that people have a house over their heads right now. It's, it's really exciting. Um, the city's management of that process was atrocious. I, I can't even begin to tell you how that community engagement process went. There was no engagement, none. Um, so from your team, either not communicating with us at all, gaslighting us, um, telling us outright lies that are on video that you guys have lied about. Um, so my question is twofold. How do you feel like the engagement could have been done better? And number two, do you think that spending over $6 million at just one SRV for one year to house about 70 people is a good model going forward to address the issues facing our houseless neighbors? That's one year, $6 million. Okay, you asked your question. Yeah. yeah. I think the engagement process in all of our Cypress villages was challenging on a lot of levels. I think we also we met, I know I met and did numerous Zoom meetings on a lot of the Cypress village sites, and it was tough. Portlanders are very upset about the humanitarian crisis. They want these services. They just tend to not want them near their place, and I get that, but we have to build them, and we have to continue to move people from chronic homelessness 
to actually moving into stability. And the early results are decent. One, we have data finally. Two, we have half the people within six months moving into uh, permanent housing and we're getting to know them by name and the services are happening. So the fact is we can't continue to think that it's okay to just have people living on the streets with no services and then hope that they might move into a single occupancy unit and think that they're going to suddenly become okay. This is a really, no, this is a really complex crisis. And it affects me personally, I lost a brother to this. And it's like when people have mental health, behavioral health issues that have been unchecked, living in a state with the worst behavioral health and mental health services in the country, it's like we had to do something. So I'll be very proud of my time in office that I swung really hard to wake up the county to get some real services that meet people where they are and we're starting to get results. And this needed to be part of the system. And so I'm very, very proud of that. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, the ARPA money has been very helpful to get this up and running. We have to look at the long-term model and sustainability of it. And if we get results and we keep moving people into stability, if we get those same people like you have at Pensla Crossing that used to be houseless, that used to be um, incarcerated, they're now turning their lives around and are working and are paying rent and are providing and are part of the community. That's the goal is to move into a place where you become whole again. And that's what we're working on right now. And so I apologize that the engagement wasn't up to standards that I would have liked. I definitely apologize that the, the response from my office, which you're talking about the Safe Rest Village team as well, and you're talking about my office as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and we fought hard to get them as a provider. And so I'm just happy to hear that things today are much better than they were. And all we can do is keep moving forward, Ashley. We will continue to meet with George. We will continue to work with Urban Alchemy, to work with the neighbors. And the fact is that the, it's getting better in the area. Everyone is telling us that. I think I met with you about a month ago, right? That's not true. Actually, I'm not going to do this with you because I did go to the meeting and I know that our staff followed up and you even saw in real time that I was uh, talking to George about some of the follow up. So so let's just know that um, things are improving and we're moving forward. I'm sorry you're upset, but I can't. I wasn't going to not do anything. So I had a choice. I had the assignment the mayor gave me in 2020 to the dotted line to the county. I had a choice. I could have just posed and said everything's going to get better and do nothing. I didn't choose that. I decided to build things, build services that were needed in Portland, Oregon, build services that met people on the ground. It wasn't okay to just have unsupervised uh, campgrounds with no services, Ashley, right in your backyard. And so we're doing the best we can to move out of this crisis. And that's what I will continue to do as a public servant is to do things that are hard. And, and build them because we've got to do better in Portland and we must have a better system for people who are unstable to stability. And so I, I just want you, and so onward, onward, yes. And I know that there's also been communication with Urban Alchemy, with the neighbors, which we asked them to do that's providing, Tom, do you have some more information on that? Clearly. Yes, yes. And we do have seven now that are up and running, one more than promised in less than two years. I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, and thank yes. So this is my, um, I think, seventh one. And it's humbling that it was by far the most difficult. And I live in this neighborhood. I went to Roosevelt High School. I'm a little bit emotional right now. Um, I get the issues that you're talking about. I care about them too. They're complex. We're working and we're, bre we're breaking down silos. Do you know how many silos we've had to break down just to get the Safe Rest Villages built? 
because everyone was doing this. One thing you'll never see from me is keep blaming everyone else. It's like, we got to come together, stop our whining, and be the scrappy river city that I grew up in that gets stuff done. I will always take action. It may not be perfect. I'm going to keep learning from it. I'm going to keep getting back up and fight for Portland because this city can do better. And it's a city that I want to live in until I die. And I hope that all of you can continue to have some grace as we move forward to get out of this crisis. I thank you, neighbors. I thank you so much. Take care. And I also want to say thank you. I, as I look out here and every one of you, and I asked if there were questions, there's a lot of passion in this group, and I really appreciate that. And I invite you to continue to be passionate and to continue to bring these issues up. Um, but I've been told that we have to stop at this point with the Q&A. Now, uh, who's the next person up? Um, Okay. I think we have someone from emergency services. Okay, here we go. Can everybody hear me? All right, I'll channel my inner rock star. I'm going to hold the microphone this way. You can't hear me. Okay. Wow. All right, how about now? All right. Uh, I'm Bob Causey, director of the Bureau of Emergency Communications. We're the 911 center for city of Portland, but also many of you may not know for the entire county. We answer 911 for Gresham, Corbett, Savvy Island, the entire county. I always like to say that 911 is a barometer of the condition of a community. And what we're experiencing with 911 is a difficult condition that we're all living with. We have um, about 120 dispatchers, 44 of whom, 44 are in training right now. COVID really hit us hard. And after COVID, we of course know what happened downtown, the protests, everything involved with that. And we experienced a lot of burnout with our dispatchers and we lost a lot of folks. Well, uh, on top of that, we've had a 40% increase in 911 calls. All right, 40% increase in 911 calls since 2018. Now, when you look at that increase plus a decrease in staffing, that's really impacted our ability to uh, perform our mission. And our mission is to answer 911 and dispatch help because we're a consolidated center that answers the call for help and sends out police, fire, medical, and Portland Street response, all under one roof, all on the same floor. So our dispatchers right now, I was encouraged when I uh, walked out of my office today to come here. We have eight trainees of the 44 trainees that just graduated the academy. They are sitting on the floor as a group, each of them taking one call at a time while their peers watched and a coach was assisting them. Now that's not ideal because in an ideal world, we'd have one coach for every trainee. But when you consider we have 44 trainees, we don't have that many coaches. So we're aggressively getting our trainees certified. And one thing that we've been doing is focusing on uh, call taker training. And we have six trainees right now that should be fully certified in call taking, able to answer 911 calls independently by the end of September. We also have six more that should be certified in police dispatch in that same time frame. So what does that mean to you? That means that hopefully we're not going to be seeing the wait times that we're experiencing right now. Our wait times now, believe it or not, are better than they were last summer but they're still not good. My goal as a director, my goal as a member in the community is to answer 911 calls right away. There's a national standard that talks about 15 seconds or 20 seconds, but honestly, I don't care about that. What I care about is a real person answering the phone when you need it. So uh, we are aggressively hiring, we're aggressively training, and we have eight more trainees starting September 5th 
And we have two more academies starting one in December and one in April. Now at that point, we'll be pretty darn close to having all of our positions filled, everyone that we lost through COVID. And uh, because it takes about a year and a half to get fully through training for our dispatchers, we're looking at next summer, hopefully being completely different than this summer's been. I think I have time for maybe one question. Does anybody have a question? I told you everything you want to know. Oh, yeah, there's a question. They do, and that's part of the problem. So we have non-emergency. Let me talk real quickly about um, our priorities, okay? We answer 911 first. That's the top priority for our call takers. It's the very same call takers that answer non-emergency. Now you're familiar with 311. 311 has been stood up fairly recently. It's still a new program in the city. In my perfect world, I'd like to see it be a 24 seven operation so that 311 calls can be answered instead of the focus on non-emergency, especially at nighttime, because 311 operates right now seven days a week, not holidays, but seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So after eight o'clock at night, you, you call 311 and you'll get some information from the, from the recording, but there's really not anyone there to help you. So in my perfect world, and I don't always get what I want, but I certainly ask for it, is 911 for emergencies and 311 for everything else. But in the meantime, we have the non-emergency number. And when you call the non-emergency number, sometimes the wait time is 40 minutes, an hour, sometimes even longer. And all of that depends on the call volume to 911 because we're answering 911 calls first. So um, we've implemented a technology that's currently being tested. We're almost done testing it and it's been very successful called case service. And you may have seen something in the news about it using artificial intelligence to process some non-emergency calls. I use the term AI or artificial intelligence and that freaks some people out. But really what this is, is uh, a phone tree that sounds like a real person asks you questions, understands what your answers are, and it will process calls in a way that will hopefully, when it's not necessary to be transferred to one of our call takers, shunt them to either the 311 program or to another service within the city. Or believe it or not, we can actually text information to you to file a report online. And the system will send you the link so you can file that information. So we've ran five tests so far. We just completed a 72 hour test and our tech team is giving it a solid A, 93%. And 72 hours is a lot of calls to process when you consider that we're processing, gosh, during the heat wave, 2,500 911 calls every day. Less than that in non-emergency for sure, but we're not able to get to the non-emergency. So, so what does it matter, right? We're processing 911 calls. So the next test we have scheduled is for one week, a solid week. And I'm imagining the results will be pretty similar. And at that point, we're gonna turn that system on full time. Yeah. No, not 911. The AI system is only for non-emergency. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We have one more person to share, and that is Jeremy from the Neighborhood Emergency Services. That's you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see people trying to leave. You shouldn't leave yet. This is a great part of the presentation. My name is Jeremy Van Curen. I'm the Community Resilience Manager for the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. And first of all, I just want to really thank you for making me part of this, this, this gathering. Um, emergency managers don't go to parties very often. We don't get invited because I, I just got back from vacation. I got invited to exactly one cookout this summer. And the reason why is because, you know, we, we, we come to your house, we're, we're eating a hamburger and we're, we're like, this is, this is a lovely place you got here, but you know, during an earthquake, this is going to collapse. Like you, you really need to get this, you know, retrofitted. And then my wife was like, so 
haha, <laughs> okay, PTSD. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to explain really quickly what PBIM does in an over, oversimplified way, because a lot of people don't know who we are. Port, uh, PBIM, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, uh, we have three primary missions. Um, again, this is oversimplified, but the first one is uh, we are the custodians of what's called the Emergency Coordination Center, or the ECC. It's uh, We actually share a, a building with uh, Director Kazi. He has the best vending machines. And um, that the ECC is the location where city leaders gather during a major disaster or other um, public safety agencies are going to coordinate uh, their work during planned events. So, for example, we activate the ECC during the Rose Festival. Or if there's a major, a really major fire, we might activate the ECC. So that's one of the things that we do. Second thing that we do is uh, we do internal bureau customer service. We do what's called continuity of operations planning, or COOP for short. And the idea behind COOP planning is we go to the bureaus, we say, what are you doing to plan for a disaster? Can we help you with that? Simple. It's actually really complicated, but simple. Third thing that we do, our third mission is the mission that I lead, and that's the Community Resilience Mission. And the reason why uh, what we do is important is because uh, we know uh, very consistently with disasters that between 90 to 95% of all the people who are rescued in a disaster are rescued by their neighbors. Did everybody just hear that? Between 90 to 95% of all the people who are rescued are rescued by you. And I'm not here just to talk about disasters, but also community resilience. And I know that every single person here cares about community resilience because if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. So we're not gonna just look at this in a siloized emergency management perspective, but I, I wanna tell you first about our flagship program, which is the Neighborhood Emergency Team Program. And actually, um, we have a lot of active teams here in True North. Uh, so I got to give a shout out to Arbor Lodge, Canton, University Park, great teams there. The Basic Net program is uh, a series of classes where you would learn the skill sets that you would need in order to respond safely and effectively in the aftermath of a major disaster. And I'm not talking just necessarily an earthquake. We've been doing a lot of deployments because of the heat waves and the, uh, the, the extreme weather events that we've been having. So for example, um, in Clackamas County in 2020, you'll probably all remember that there was a lot of wildland fires. Uh, our team opened up an evacuation center to assist Clackamas uh, County residents and we intake them and we took care of them. That's the kind of stuff that we do. Um, so you take the basic net class, it's about 25 hours total in the classroom. We run about six to seven classes a year and uh, it's 100% free of charge to you. We do ask you to pay for your own response equipment, but if you can't afford it, we'll just buy you a kit. We have a, a grant program that we run. And uh, once you graduate from basic net and you've learned things like search and rescue, uh, disaster communications, uh, disaster psychology, things like that. Also some basic medical triage and treatment. Um, you can join your team and we have 80 teams, roughly 80. I think actually the last count was 87 teams spread throughout Portland. Um, and then you can also take some of our advanced training. So we give our, uh, our volunteers access to wilderness first aid training, uh, to advanced radio communication. Again, all of this free of charge. Um, and even if you never use uh, wilderness first aid to respond in an earthquake, uh, I get net volunteers coming to me all the time saying things like, you know what, we haven't had the earthquake yet, but I, I saved a life today. Like I found somebody on the trail who was injured. I saved that person's life. Or we had a heat wave. Uh, I've got an elderly neighbor. I called them. I made sure that they were okay. They weren't. We got them to the hospital. We get that kind of stuff all the time. Um, so uh, if you're now asking yourselves, and I really hope you are, how do I join net? I'm going to show you a magic trick. Probably weren't expecting that tonight. Um, these are called pocket preps, and I have these for you. I'm going to put them towards the exit so that if you want one, you can grab one as you're, as you're leaving, and also my business card so that you can communicate with us. And uh, these, um, these, as you can see, it's about the size of a credit card until I do this. And this has disaster preparedness information on it for you to fill out. 
and also has links to uh, how you can join us in our training. Now, I was saying earlier that this is relevant to community resilience. It's not just siloized into um, emergency management stuff. We know there have been studies conducted about this, that a community that is better prepared for a disaster has less social isolation, lower rates of crime, better public health outcomes. If you want to be a part of that and keep yourself off the sidelines for, uh, for community resilience, I highly encourage you to come join us because anyway, it's free, except for your time. We need a lot of your time uh, for training, but we, we want to keep you safe. Yeah, question. And you know this fact. We have two rivers on either side, and we are trapped because of zoning issues. So that was Frog Ferry. We have um, the casinos and other type funds. So we have, what were the other questions that people brought up? We, we know that in um, in um, Hawaii, people did jump into the river, and I've heard you say many times, Nobody's going to jump into the river here, and we'll need river access. I know in Lincoln we have no river access because it's been zoned away. So everything that people brought up tonight has to do with resiliency. And what is, I love Ned, but what's frustrating is that nobody's saying, how do we prevent these things? Because I know I have the net barrel on my front porch. Thank, Thank you. Time. My community, I promise you, not given that. I can stick, I can stick, I can stick, I can stick, but no one goes there and still stick, you know, and because there are boys, that's why people are learning. And I, I just don't see why we, I want to do this, I'm not saying I don't want to do it, but we have to work on all these other things that people brought up. So because we're trapped. And so to put a barrel on my porch when we're trapped with oil tanks, no river access, no ferry, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me to do to have it be this way. Sure. I, I respect what you're saying, Sarah. And what I would say in response is that emergency management, I let me actually back up a bit. Not emergency management, emergency response, disaster response is not about the equipment. It's about the people. And in fact, the thing that you can do best to prepare for a disaster, I'm not making this up, is just know who your neighbors are. I mean, have a kit, have a plan. That's great. I, I love that you have one of the barrels in Linton, but uh, I, I, what I, I love most about Linton is that it's such a tight-knit community where everybody knows each other. And the other thing about preparedness is, again, it, it is also about the people and what I can't do as a as a, uh, a bureaucrat, frankly, is dictate policy. But what I can do is I can help you find the answers and the information that you need to uh, to talk with folks like Commissioner Ryan so that you are better prepared to make those arguments. Yeah. So so, for example, like the frog ferry. I can't say yes or no to the frog ferry, but what I can say is, would it be good to have in a disaster? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got no problem with that at all. Um, so, yeah, that's not a that's not an endorsement officially. I'm just I'm just giving you an example. Oh, I'm in trouble now. Okay, I, I do I have do we have time for more questions? I don't actually know. Okay, uh, question. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I... Uh... 
So uh, let me restate what you said just to make sure everybody heard it and then correct me if I got any of it wrong, but you were talking about the importance of evacuation plans and making sure that those are formulated. And I, I can tell you that we do actually have a citywide evacuation plan. Um, a lot of people think of an evacuation plan in the context of the earthquake, which I, I really need to disabuse people of that notion. Um, after a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, you're going nowhere. Um, even, even if you have gas, you won't have roads. <laughs> so, um, but if we're talking about a fire and then particularly um, uh, areas of the city around Forest Park that are vulner that's vulnerable to that, um, I think we're gonna be, I'll, I'm just kind of, again, I actually just got back today. Uh, I'm getting the stop talking thing, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I really want to see what was going on in Hawaii with things like sirens, for example. Um, that was just on the news as I was driving here. And I was like, that's really interesting how that all played out. But there's, there's a lot of back and forth with that. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the stage up. I'll put these up front. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. We appreciate your participation and your questions and your smiling faces. Please help yourself to the food. There's a lot of it still left and feel free to mingle. And if you wouldn't mind grabbing a chair and taking it inside. Thanks so much. Good night.